When the topic of extraterrestrials is raised in academic circles, the discussion invariably turns to the Drake Equation and the Fermi Paradox. But just because these are so-called academic points of view does not mean they are not based on assumptions and thus inherently flawed. We begin with the Drake Equation because its theories and principles are closely related to the Fermi Paradox. The equation was formulated by Frank Drake in 1961 in an attempt to find a systematic means to evaluate the numerous probabilities involved in the existence of alien life. The speculative equation considers the rate of star formation in the galaxy, the fraction of stars with planets and the number per star that are habitable, the fraction of those planets that develop life, the fraction that develop intelligent life, the fraction that have detectable technological intelligent life, and finally, the length of time such communicable civilizations are detectable. The Drake equation has been used by both optimists and pessimists with very different results. The first scientific meeting on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, otherwise known as SETI, included Frank Drake and Carl Sagan in attendance. They speculated that the number of civilizations was probably between 1,000 and 100 million civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. Of course, the fundamental problem is that in the equation they used, the last four terms are completely unknown, rendering statistical estimates impossible. This is where the pessimists step in with the Fermi paradox. In 1950, well before the formulation of the Drake equation, Physicist Enrico Fermi asked a very important question over lunch at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Based on the number of galaxies we know exist, how many stars are inside those galaxies, and how many planets potentially orbit those stars, probability states that there should be alien life. So, where is everybody? In essence, Fermi had already conceded the optimistic point of view of the forthcoming Drake equation and arrived at the most fundamental question. The Fermi paradox is a conflict between the argument that scale and probability seem to favor intelligent life being common in the universe and the seemingly total lack of evidence of intelligent life having ever arisen anywhere other than on Earth. The first aspect of the Fermi paradox is a function of the scale or the large numbers involved. There are an estimated 200 to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way and 76 trillion in the observable universe. Even if intelligent life occurs only on a minuscule percentage of planets around these stars, there might still be a great number of extant civilizations, and if the percentage were high enough, it would produce a significant number of extant civilizations in the Milky Way. But, this assumes the mediocrity principle by which the Earth is a typical planet. The second aspect of the Fermi paradox is the argument of probability. Given intelligent life's ability to overcome scarcity and its tendency to colonize new habitats, it seems possible that at least some civilizations would be technologically advanced, seek out new resources in space, and colonize their own star system and subsequently surrounding star systems. Since there is no significant evidence on Earth or elsewhere in the known universe of other intelligent life after 13.8 billion years of the universe's history, there is a conflict requiring a resolution. The Fermi paradox can be asked in two ways. The first is, why are no aliens or their artifacts found here on Earth or in the solar system? If interstellar travel is possible, even the slow kind nearly within the reach of Earth technology, then it would only take from 5 million to 50 million years to colonize the galaxy. This is relatively brief on a geological scale, let alone a cosmological one. Since there are many stars older than the Sun, and since intelligent life might have evolved earlier elsewhere, the question then becomes why the galaxy has not been colonized already. Even if colonization is impractical or undesirable to all alien civilizations, large-scale exploration of the galaxy could be possible by probes. These might leave detectable artifacts in the solar system, such as old probes or evidence of mining activity, but so far, none of these have been observed. The second form of the question is, 
Why do we see no signs of intelligence elsewhere in the universe? This version does not assume interstellar travel but includes other galaxies as well. For distant galaxies, travel times may well explain the lack of alien visits to Earth, but a sufficiently advanced civilization could potentially be observable over a significant fraction of the size of the observable universe. Even if such civilizations are rare, the scale argument indicates they should exist somewhere at some point during the history of the universe, and since they could be detected from far away over a considerable period of time, many more potential sites for their origin are within range of our observation. Fermi was not the first to ask the question. An earlier implicit mention was by Konstantin Silokovsky in an unpublished manuscript from 1933. He noted, people deny the presence of intelligent beings on the planets of the universe because, if such beings exist, they would have visited Earth and, if such civilizations existed, then they would have given us some sign of their existence. This was not a paradox for others who took this to imply the absence of ETs, but it was one for him since he believed in extraterrestrial life and the possibility of space travel. Therefore, he proposed what is now known as the zoo hypothesis and speculated that mankind is not yet ready for higher beings to contact us. The zoo hypothesis speculates on the assumed behavior and existence of technically advanced extraterrestrial life and the reasons they refrain from contacting Earth. The hypothesis is that alien life intentionally avoids communication with Earth, and one of its main interpretations is that it does so to allow for natural evolution and sociocultural development, avoiding interplanetary contamination similarly to people observing animals at a zoo. The hypothesis seeks to explain the apparent absence of extraterrestrial life despite its generally accepted plausibility and hence the reasonable expectation of its existence. Aliens might, for example, choose to allow contact once the human species has passed certain technological, political, or ethical standards. They might withhold contact until humans force contact upon them, possibly by sending a spacecraft to planets they inhabit. Alternatively, a reluctance to initiate contact could reflect a sensible desire to minimize risk. An alien society with advanced remote sensing technologies may conclude that direct contact with neighbors confers added risk to oneself without an added benefit. In 1973, MIT radio astronomer John Ball published a paper in which he suggested that the lack of success in uncovering cosmic company wasn't due to a lack of aliens. It was because these otherworldly sentients had agreed to a hands-off policy. They've kept their distance not because we're imperfect, but because of our right to pursue our own destiny. Diversity is something that everyone in the cosmos is assumed to value so life-bearing worlds should be left to their own evolutionary development. Ball's idea sounds something like Star Trek's famous Prime Directive, which forbade spacefaring members of the Federation from doing anything that might interfere with other cultures or civilizations, even if that interference was well-intentioned. Bell went further, proposing that we may live in a metaphorical zoo, a kind of cosmic Eden. The aliens of the galaxy have somehow arranged things so that our planet is shielded from them by one-way bars. They can observe us, but we can't observe them. One nice thing about this conjecture is that it offers a solution to the long-standing puzzle of the Fermi Paradox. The zoo hypothesis has been in the news recently because it also provides justification for an activity known as METI, short for Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Simply stated, METI practitioners transmit radio signals into space with the hope of provoking a response from any aliens who might pick them up. Simply put, METI's deliberate transmissions might lead to a discovery of cosmic company because the broadcast would tell the aliens that we no longer require their helicopter parenting. We're adult enough for them to get in touch. 
If there is a plurality of alien cultures, however, this theory may break down under the uniformity of motive concept because it would take just a single extraterrestrial civilization to decide to act contrary to the imperative within our range of detection for it to be undone, and the probability of such a violation increases with the number of civilizations. In fact, the idea that all extraterrestrials are keen to keep the evolution of our planet free and natural sounds odd, self-centered, and a bit too altruistic. Let's face it, the Prime Directive has never been in fashion with humans. Indeed, we seem to prefer the opposite. On Earth, we interfere with one another's cultural development all the time. As is the case for the academic world so often, when it comes to the Fermi Paradox and nearly all the hypotheses which attempt to resolve it, science has employed a fundamental logical fallacy. It's called begging the question. Specifically, here is the question. Have humans discovered evidence of extraterrestrial life? The basis of the Fermi Paradox and its proposed resolutions assume the answer is automatically no. Science has categorically answered no to what is still very much an open question. But in order to keep things nice and tidy in the academic world, scientists, researchers, scholars, and even teachers nearly all agree that nothing has met the evidentiary rigors of their respective disciplines. And whenever the archive observes this logical fallacy being employed, we are always reminded of Carl Sagan's famous quote, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. So, in addition to completely ignoring the modern-day UFO events that are increasing in frequency across the planet every year, science also disregards a plethora of archaeological discoveries and revelations. Apparently, for academia, it is much easier to let myths and legends remain myths and legends than to seriously consider different translations and interpretations of our ancestors' communications to their descendants. Indeed, it is profoundly easier to maintain the current inaccurate and outdated historical paradigm than to admit willful ignorance and subsequently replace most of academia's reference books. Academic texts have literally become, to the academics, more important than the text of our ancient ancestors many of which are still not translated or even discovered for that matter. And it is on this point the archive interjects with what is perhaps a more practical and encompassing hypothesis, one with which our regular viewers are well acquainted, the ancient astronaut hypothesis. For those that snicker at the idea of ancient astronauts, the archive thought it prudent to provide an illustration of how academia, and science in particular, can make seemingly wild assumptions about things that have zero evidence, but if they reach consensus with one another, it seems fine to do so. Our example is the concept of dark matter. Check out the following passage concerning dark matter. So, out of the gate we have a condition in this scientific postulation that states if it exists, it must, it must interact with a different type of matter. Then we have a statement about what is thought, not observed or proven, what is thought about its nature, and by the way, that is based on subatomic particles that also have not yet been discovered. Then, we are told the primary candidate for dark matter is also something we have yet to discover. It's almost laughable. Yet, at the same time, many in academia categorically deny the existence of extraterrestrials now or in our past with a straight face. Yeah, right. So, we talked a bit about the zoo hypothesis, and we find it interesting how it could be applicable for a portion of the ancient astronaut hypothesis. One of the components of the hypothesis is the existence of a group of beings referenced by the ancient Sumerians called the Anunnaki. In our previous presentation called Anunnaki Genetic Engineering of Humans, we explained how thousands of years before the Bible came into existence with its version of the creation of humans, the Sumerian text, in much greater detail, 
chronicled the Anuna's genetic experiments as they engineered the first humans. The text explains it took six attempts to reach a successful outcome which would allow for the insemination of a new humanoid to produce the first true humans. Ninma was the original scientist trying to engineer humans. The electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature states in entry 56 through 61, Ninma took clay from the top of the abzu in her hand and she fashioned from it first a man. Many researchers have speculated this genetic engineering took place in what the Bible calls the Garden of Eden. They posit that Adam and Eve were the first two creations and were used to procreate humanity. Indeed, the garden could have been a biosphere, one where the genetically engineered humanoids were studied in order to determine any needed improvements. So, in many respects, this place called the Abzu was kind of like what we know of as a zoo. But to be more precise, one might compare it to a huge genetic laboratory. And even if you believe it is preposterous that the human race may be hybrids of extraterrestrials, the accounts that our ancestors were contacted by these extraterrestrials should at least be given the same academic consideration as the yet undiscovered dark matter that has no evidence of existence. Maybe. Instead of assuming there is no evidence of extraterrestrial contact in the present nor past and then concocting numerous explanations as to why we are not worthy of such contact, maybe the scientists will consider revisiting their flawed assumptions about our distant past.